This is Don Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcast that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to Episode 13 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries, both natural and supernatural, from the perspectives of both faith and reason. And in this episode, we're talking about the mystery of cloning. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Before we get started, I want to remind folks uh, to remember to like the podcast, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, on Facebook. We have a Facebook page uh, to retweet our episodes on Twitter, leave us comments, uh, on our show notes, uh, on Facebook and Twitter and wherever you are, you, you, you find the show, uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can do that in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app, or even YouTube. Uh, we upload these as videos on YouTube. Uh, it's an audio only video. Uh, and when you subscribe, make sure you hit the bell on YouTube to get notifications and please especially share the podcast with your friends. Please, uh, you know, if you're enjoying this, help us grow our community of listeners. Uh, and the more listeners we get, the more feedback we get, and the more it adds to the quality of the show. And we really do appreciate that. Uh, and I uh, also want to add, please stick around to the end of this show uh, because we're going to have mysterious feedback, like I said, uh, and mysterious headlines, as always. Yeah. So, Jimmy, you have uh, something you want to uh, say to the folks as well before we begin. Right. Yeah. So right now, uh, StarQuest, the podcasting network that produces Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, is having a giving campaign. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and we're devoted to exploring uh, geek culture from a Catholic perspective as a way of bringing people closer to Jesus. That's part of our name, StarQuest. It's a reference to the Star of Bethlehem and how it guided the wise men to the baby Jesus. So um, we have a spiritual mission, and we need your help to support that mission. Um, we haven't run a giving campaign in a couple of years, and as a result, our funds are now getting to the depleted point. Uh, we made a decision, the board of SQPN did, uh, earlier this year to hire a full-time producer so that we could produce a range of podcasts, not just limp along producing one. That's one of the reasons that you have Mysterious World coming to you, because I don't have time to do all the production work and the file uploading and everything. Uh, Dom is doing all of that, and he's also overseeing all of our different podcasting efforts. And we have, in addition to needing to be able to pay him, we've got the hosting costs. We have uh, computer software and equipment, sound equipment we need to uh, pay for and things like that. And so uh, we really do need your support. If we don't get your support, then we will have to scale back and, uh, you know, and and limp along and not fulfill our mission. So we really do need to hear from you right now. We're getting up to the Christmas season and lots of people show their support for different nonprofits at this time of year. We really hope you will uh, show your support for us. The way to do that is by going to sqpn.com. That's sqpn.com for StarQuest Podcast Network. Dot com, um, and it's sqpn.com slash give, and you can become one of our regular Patreon supporters. We have some uh, thank you gifts we'd like to send you. Uh, they're themed around your favorite StarQuest shows, whether it might be Doctor Who or Star Trek or even Jimmy Inkin's Mysterious World. I picked out some uh, course materials, some books, uh, and audio that I think you would find really fascinating that uh, links in to the topics we discuss here on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So by all means, go to sqpn.com slash give, click on the Patreon button, and you'll find out all about those mysterious thank yous that we'd like to send you. Um, also, uh, remember, your, your donations are tax deductible. So as you're preparing 
you're giving for the remainder of the year to ensure a good uh, tax uh, refund for you next year, uh, please do remember us in your giving. We do need it at this time. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for that message. And uh, thank you, listeners. Uh, so let's get into the the topic for today, which is the, the mystery of cloning. Now, when we talk about cloning, what, what, are, what are we actually talking about? Yeah, on this podcast, we're going to be talking about cloning an entire new organism that's genetically identical to a previously existing one. Sometimes when scientists talk about cloning, they, they're not talking about a whole organism. They'll be talking about like cloning a kidney or cloning a liver or just something that's a single organ, but not a whole organism. And that's not the kind of cloning that we're interested in here. Uh, that's an interesting subject. We may talk about that in the future. But today we're going to be talking about coming up with a whole new organism based on a previous one. And uh, so the, the this is a a staple of science fiction. You know, we, the, you see this in all kinds of stories. There have been lots of movies. Uh, I think there's been at least two Arnold Schwarzenegger movies that have included cloning, for uh -huh. instance. Um, and all kinds of uh, fantastical ideas are out there about what cloning is and that sort of thing. So, but but what is cloning as we as we know it today? There there are a couple different kinds, right? Yeah. Um. Uh, so the two kinds you'll hear about most often are called therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning. And in th therapeutic cloning, the idea is you produce a clone and you do something with it that with an idea towards providing a therapy of some kind. This could be producing a, a batch of clones and then studying them to learn more about, say, embryology and how embryos of a given species develop. But then you don't let them come to term. You kill them off before you let them uh, be born. Um, or you might create a batch of clones and then process them so that they become some kind of therapy that you could apply to someone. So not not only are you studying them, but you're also using them to produce a treatment of some kind, like stem cell treatments or something like that. Stem cell lines are are often based on a kind of therapeutic cloning, not of in, not necessarily of entire organisms, but they they are in this batch. What we're more interested in, or what we're going to spend more of our time talking about, though, is not therapeutic cloning, but what's called reproductive cloning. Reproductive cloning is where you do bring the clones to term so that they are born and they grow up. And so it, ideally, if you're a millionaire who has no moral problems with cloning, you could like have a mini me. A little, a little clone of yourself that you then bring to term and let live on to replace you once you die. And and uh, there is lots of stuff in like in sci-fi where they clone adults. You know, where like the clone is a perfect adult human copy. Yeah, and that's really more that's more sci-fi. I mean, maybe there would be a way to do that one day, but we're nowhere close to that now. Right, the way it works right now is if you were to if you were to clone a human being. And mm -hmm. there have not been reproductive human clones made yet. But if you were to uh, to have a clone baby of yourself, it would grow at a normal rate. It would have different experiences than you growing up. It would have different memories than you growing up. So you wouldn't, at the end of the process, just have an identical adult duplicate of you. You would have a genetic duplicate of you that grew up at a later time and in different circumstances. And that would take 20 years or whatever to mature. Okay. Um, so I don't want to get too much into that with, uh, I want to kind of, uh, ease into the various implications of that. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but first let's start with the claims, the claims. Um, so, so almost the, the pro cloning claims, I think they are. Yeah. So, um, among people who support cloning, uh, they'll say this is going to, this is a good thing because it'll give us new medical treatments, even personalized medical treatment so that, you know, if, if let's say you have a specific problem that is based on your genes or your immune system, like let's say you need a new liver or a new kidney, well, we could clone one for you that will um, match your genetic code, have your same immune system markers, and so you won't have problems with, with uh, tissue rejection, 
that you otherwise might have. Also, people will say we can learn a lot about how organisms develop if we make clones. We can test drugs on them to see how the drugs uh, operate, um, what effects they have. Hypothetically, uh, if you're doing the transplant route and creating organs for transplant, hypothetically, you could clone somebody a whole new body um, and just transplant your brain into it, and you would have a brand new body to live out uh, a whole another multi-decade lifespan in. That's so hypothetical still. Hypoth hypothetically. Right. Another, another thing that's been claimed is this would be a way – for uh, people to replace a dead child or pet that they really cared about. Um, if you had a child and your child died, well, you could clone your child and it would kind of be like having that same child back. Or if you had a dog or a cat, you really loved the dog or cat, you could clone the dog or cat and have, a, a you know, it kind be kind of like having that one back. It would presumably have many of the same temperaments and behave the same way and the different qualities that you loved about the first one. There have also been claims that um, this has actually been done in humans. Now, these claims have been very controversial. Uh, some scientists in some part of the world have said that, you know, we've, we either have or are about to make human clones. And so far, those claims have tended to fall apart on scrutiny upon scrutiny. There were some unethical scientists making premature claims. But uh, if you look at the Wikipedia page uh, discussing this, it has a note where it says in January 2008, Dr. Andrew French and Samuel Wood of the biotechnology company Stemogen announced that they had successfully created the first five mature human embryos using SCNT, that somatic um, so, cell nuclear transfer. We'll talk about that. In this case, each embryo is created by taking a nucleus from a skin cell donated by Wood and a colleague and inserted into a human egg from which the nucleus had been removed. That's what uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer is. You take the nucleus, which has the genetic material out of one cell and stick it in another cell like an like an ovum that's been had its nucleus taken out, and then you cause it to divide. Uh, it says the embryos were developed only to the blastocyst stage. That's a very early stage where they're they're composed of a number of cells, but they are still very small. At which point they were studied in processes that destroyed them. So according to this claim. It, for ten years, we've had uh, we we've, we've had human embryos that have been cloned using this method, but they haven't yet been brought to term. As and far as so, we know, <laughs> as far as we know, yeah. Okay, so that so so there are these are the claims about cloning that that um, it it it, it pro, could, kind of pro cloning claims pro cloning claims so that we could have um, uh, b beneficial medical treatments we could replace uh, uh, you know dead loved ones or, or pets or children and that it's already begun now what are the counter claims like uh, the anti cloning claims. Well, um, so an obvious one would be that some or all of the uses that we've just mentioned are immoral, that they're unethical for various reasons and we shouldn't be pursuing them. Also, and this is more a claim of a more religious nature that some people have made, is that clones wouldn't have souls. So if you cloned uh, a human a child, let's say the child would have no soul. That's been a feature of a lot of, a lot of the science fiction where um... – the reaction of religious people toward the clones is that they have no soul and therefore are abominations that must be destroyed. Uh, we could yeah, talk about like that. We could talk about how what we think religious people like, say, the church, how it would react react to actual cloned humans. We could talk about that when we get to the oh, faith perspective. Yeah, we're getting there. Yes, mm -hmm. good, good. All right, so uh, so those are uh, pretty compact counterclaims, and and uh, so. What do we know about cloning so we can uh, make our way toward the perspectives? Well, people tend to think of cloning as if it's a really new thing that it, and in certain techniques like the the uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer that we mentioned, that is a new technique. We have not that's only recently become possible. Um, but actually, we've been artificially cloning organisms for millennia. 
this cloning itself is not a new thing. Um, the term clone uh, was produced by uh, the scientist J.B.S. Haldane um, a little more than a century ago. He took it from the Greek word klon, which means twig. And the reason he took it from that word is because um, we've actually been cloning things that grow on twigs like grapes for millennia. That's one of the reasons you have seedless grapes, because mm -hmm. without seeds, they can't reproduce on their own. The way we reproduce them is you take a twig from a grapevine that, and you, you know, either graft it onto another grapevine or plant it and get it to grow roots. But basically, you're twigging off new grapes from the new grapevines from the original grapevine. And in the process, you're cloning them. It's also why we have wine in the world today, uh, because of there was a uh, a disaster in the grape, the wine grape growing uh, farming uh, decades ago that wiped out major portions of of uh, vine vineyards around around the world in various places in the world, uh, mm -hmm. and that they recovered by uh, grafting and cloning the right. grape varietals uh, onto hardier stock that survived. Uh, that, right. that imparted the, the the ability to survive. So cloning is is fundamental to human agriculture, certainly. Yeah, and it's as I said, it's been around for millennia. Even Saint Paul, if you if you read the Book of Romans and you look in Romans chapter nine through eleven, especially in chapter eleven, he has this image where he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, but he uses an analogy to uh, to uh, agricultural grafting from one plant onto another. And um, and in the process, that would produce cloning as part of that. So this is something that we've had from all the way back to Jesus Day and before. And it's not just grapes, other uh, plants too, uh, we've used cloning with like potatoes, bananas, things like that. Okay. In addition to humans artificially cloning organisms, many species naturally clone themselves. An obvious example of that are uh, many kinds of bacteria that reproduce asexually. They, you'll have a single bacterium. It'll divide in two through a process called mitosis. Each of the, each of the two resulting bacteria takes half of the genetic material of the original and it twins itself. So it's each one is genetically identical to the original. In addition, uh, there are some plants that naturally clone themselves, including uh, some kinds of blueberry plants. Also, some fungi will do this. And even some animals have a kind of cloning called parthenogenesis. This occurs in species where either the males have all died out or where males are very uncommon. And in these cases, females can become pregnant using their own genetic matter, just so it's one female, it's not involving another female, and the result uh, will be a clone. And this happens in some kinds of insects, crustaceans, worms, hammerhead sharks, Komodo dragons, and some lizards. So this is something that uh, exists in the natural world. It's part of nature. And it even naturally occurs in humans. Parthenogenesis doesn't naturally occur in humans, but cloning does in the case of identical twins, mm. because you start with one zygote that is not genetically identical to either of its parents. So it has half of the half of the genes of the father, half of the genes of the mother. But then at some point early in pregnancy, the um, when an identical twinning occurs, that original uh, developing embryo will split into two copies, which are genetically identical and therefore which are clones. Um, there are some interesting questions that you know are wrapped up there, but basically we we've, we've had human clones for all of human history. We call them identical twins. Hmm. It's an interesting idea that uh, that um, the the the. The implication is that if we were to do artificial human cloning, the clone is therefore the original, quote unquote, the twin of that original, just displaced in time, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, way of thinking about it. Yeah. So, and and in fact, that may we because we don't have all the questions answered as far as I'm aware about exactly how identical twinning occurs. 
that may be what happens in some cases with identical twins. It may not be that the um, that the original embryo splits exactly in two. It may be that a little piece of it buds off to become the second twin. And in that case, you might have a claim to saying, okay, this one twin is the original and this other budded off from it. All the twins listening to this episode now will start to say to the uh, their their brother or sister, I'm the original. You're just the copy. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, what what are the methods of artificial cloning that that are available to scientists? Well, there's basically two. One of them is artificial twinning. And this is basically it's like uh, taking a twig off of a grapevine or in the case of an animal uh, taking an embryo and at a very early stage where this is still possible, pulling it apart or at least pulling part of it off so that the other part can continue to develop and grow normally. Um, so it's it's basically the same thing. It's just it, in the case of an animal, you can't do it with a, with a mature organism. You have to do it at a very early stage. Because um, if you take like a, a, a mature human and pull them apart, you're not going to get two humans as a result. We're, we're not going, worms. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're not. And drawing and quartering does not produce clones. If it did, <laughs> it wouldn't have been used as a punishment for so long. Right. Um, the other method is the one we already mentioned, somatic cell nuclear transfer. Somatic just means bodily. So you take a cell from a person's body, maybe a skin cell, you take out the nucleus, uh, which has the DNA, and then you transfer that into a new cell that's had its nucleus taken out, and then you perhaps an ovum, and then you cause that to begin to divide and develop normally. So those are the two methods. And and so we've talked about like how cloning, you know, we've been doing as human beings, we've been doing it for millennia. But the ability to clone uh, a, a an animal, uh, a higher level of beings, shall we say, uh, to birth, that is that is something that has occurred in your mind in your lifetime. Right. Um, the most famous example of this was Dolly the sheep. Um, Dolly was produced, I forget the exact year, but it's been within the last couple of decades. Yeah. Um, and Dolly illustrated the difficulty of doing this with a higher organism like a mammal. Um, it took apparently three, uh, 434 attempts to clone a sheep before they finally got it right. Mm. So they had to try and try and try. They had a lot of failures on their way to success. Subsequent to Dolly being cloned, we've cloned a lot of other animals, some of which have made headlines like Snuppy the clone puppy, um, but uh, others have uh, just been the subject of research and haven't really made it into the popular press. Okay, so so that's that's sort of a, an encapsulation of what we know about cloning. From a perspective of reason, what should what do we say about cloning? From just from a well, logic and reason perspective. Actually, well, let's let's hit the uh, the faith perspective first. Okay. Um, in creating. So we have to make some differentiations here, and they kind of go back. Some one of them goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the episode. If you're cloning a whole new organism, that's a different thing than cloning a part of an organism. Um, the church has real problems with the idea of cloning a human being in its entirety. Um, for reasons we'll talk about, but the church would not necessarily have a problem with say. Let's take some skin, some stem cells, maybe from your blood, and clone you a new kidney or liver. You know right. that because you're not creating a human being there. That could be conceived of potentially as a legitimate medical therapy, um, because kidneys and livers, since they're not humans, they don't have human rights, and consequently, it's okay to treat a kidney or a liver like a kidney or a liver. If you're creating a human being, though, you have to treat him like a human being. And that relates to the other distinction. Um, It's really humans that are the moral issue. Cloning is from a from a faith perspective is not a problem when it comes to animals or plants. Animals and plants are not the subject of rights the way humans are. We may, because of our human nature, we need to be kind and treat them in a humane way, even if we, you know, even if we eat them or something like that, we still need to be humane. 
Um, but that's because of our nature is to be humane, not because they have rights. Um, and in fact, the fact we've been cloning plants for millennia is an illustration of the fact we don't have a problem with uh, with cloning non-humans. It's when we get to humans that the issue becomes engaged. Okay. And um, just, uh, kind of some distinctions or, or some mm -hmm. some scenarios. It, what if we cloned a body without allowing consciousness? Say, you know, if you cloned and prevented the brain from developing, is that still yeah. a problem? This this one is, I mean, there's it, if you cloned individual pieces and and then put them together so that you had a kind of Frankenstein body, but they were never originally one body, then that would seem to be more morally acceptable than if you cr create an entire human body and just damage the brain so that it doesn't develop properly. That looks like you're creating a person. You're not just putting together organs. In that case, it looks like you're creating a human being and deliberately inflicting damage on the human being. Right. And you couldn't do that with a clone human any more than you could do it with a baby, with an ordinary baby human. Okay. So you know, and let's let's kind of dig down. Why, why does why from a faith perspective, from the from a Christian perspective, and I think even uh, I, I, do you know if this if cloning would be a problem for other faiths other than Christianity, so uh, Judaism or Islam, or do you happen it, to know? It's going to it's going to depend. Uh, there will be people from each faith perspective who are likely to disfavor cloning, and others who who might be open to it. The only religion I know that has a, a pro cloning stance is the Raelians. Uh, the Raelians are kind of a science fiction-y based religion that's very recent, and they actually want human cloning as a way of uh, providing immortality. Okay. And, uh, we, you know, I, I kind of hinted at the top that you know, talked about, the, you know, we, we talked about movies that depict Christians who, you know, they think that clones have no soul, therefore their abomination must be destroyed. How would, say, the church uh, react toward a cloned person? The church would say this person is a person and they have a soul. Um, there's <clears throat> there's not going to be any debate about that among Catholic theologians for a couple of reasons. One is that traditionally Catholic theology has recognized that, the, that every living creature has a soul, uh, even plants. Uh, his, classically, like back St. Thomas Aquinas would say, Plants have what are called vegetative souls that allow them to live and, and grow and reproduce. Animals have what are called sensitive souls that allow them not only to grow and reproduce, but also to feel and engage in a primitive kind of reasoning. And then humans have uh, what are called rational souls, where in addition to being able to grow and reproduce and feel, we also have a robust gift of reasoning. Um, so, so classically Christian theology has said every living thing has a soul. The soul is, in fact, the life principle of the body, as James says in his epistle in the New Testament in James chapter 2, the body without the spirit is dead. So um, if you've got a living body, then you've got a soul. It's just a question of what kind and does your soul survive death? And as we said earlier, you know, cloning is essentially a clone is essentially a twin of the original. Right. And if a twin has a soul and an independent of the other person is right. an independent person. That was that was my second point. Although I want to point out first, though, that um, in the case of human souls, we know human souls survive death because that's revealed to us. The historical view has been that animal and plant souls don't survive death. But that seems to be a theological opinion rather than an actual teaching of the church. So there's some room for discussion on that. In, but as you say, um, because uh, twins are clones, um, they have souls, and the church has always acknowledged that twins have souls. In fact, Jesus seems to have acknowledged that twins have souls, because one of his disciples was Thomas. Mm -hmm. Thomas, also known by the Greek name Didymus, was a twin, Apparently, that's what Thomas means in Aramaic and what Didymus means in Greek. So it probably wasn't his birth name. He probably had a different birth name. 
But because he was a twin, people called him, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so, the twin, and twin became his nickname. And since uh, Jesus made a twin, one of his uh, apostles, uh, now, we I have to say, we don't know he was an identical twin, but um, let's suppose he was. Uh, Jesus made him one of the apostles and obviously was concerned for the salvation of his soul. Okay, right. That, that's actually a very good, I never thought of it before, but that's a very interesting way of approaching that. Yeah. Um, and so um, when it comes down to it, a, a human clones are individual people, individual beloved children of God, just like everyone else. Right. And and you can't manipulate them. And this is one of the fundamental reasons for the immorality of cloning from a faith perspective. We'll also talk about from a reason perspective, but just from a faith perspective, God designed human reproduction to work a certain way. And while we can use medical treatments to assist that method, like, you know, giving people infertility treatments and so forth to help increase their natural fertility. Um, we can't just take the, take the process God designed for us and completely replace it with a different process, like somatic cell nuclear transfer or ripping, uh, deliberately ripping a early human embryo in half or something like that. Okay. And that's, that's why if someone were to say, well, I don't want to, you know, clone somebody or myself uh, in order to manipulate them or use them. I, it's just like I, I want to have a, a child or or something along those lines um, that not to use, but just to love. Um, that's still, like, as you just said, that still violates God's design for human reproduction. It, it, it violates God's design. It also, and this is where it blends into the more, um, into the more uh, reason-based you know, strictly natural okay. law problems with cloning humans. Um, because let's say you say, well, I just want a child. Um, well, okay, there are other ways of having children. Uh, some of them are moral, like getting married and producing a child naturally or adopting a child. You know, there are lots of children who need adoption. Um, others are not moral, like going out and raping someone or... Um, or in vitro fertilization, which also replaces is problematic from a faith perspective because it replaces God's design for how humans are supposed to reproduce. But if you're wanting a clone, there's something more involved because you have other ways of getting a child. You ha even have other ways of getting a child with genes from you and your spouse. I mean, in vitro fertilization would do that. It's, the church is going to say you shouldn't do it, but that would do it. So why is it you want an identical copy? Mm. And this is what gets us into um, one of the one of the non-religious objections to cloning from a moral perspective. You're by saying you want an identical copy of yourself. What does that say about you? What does that say about um, how much you value yourself? And what does it say about what you're doing to the new person? You're imposing your genetic identity fully on somebody else so that this person is going to have to grow up, presumably knowing I'm the copy. I'm, I'm a copy of this other person. They thought so much of themselves that they made me, and now I'm growing up in their shadow, and my entire, to the extent genes affect human destiny, they've imposed their genetic self on me in a fundamental way, leaving no room for any other person's genes. Mm. And and that there's something deeply creepy and deeply disturbing about wanting to impose yourself on another person and dominate their life genetically that way. Oh, wow. So, uh, so that's one of the, the, the reason perspective, uh, uh, ideas of why cloning is Im uh, immoral in humans. Uh, what are some of the others then? Well, um, it's also a, at, certainly at the present stage, it's a dangerous process. We mentioned how it took hundreds of attempts to get Dolly the sheep. Well, it could take hundreds or thousands of attempts to get a successful human clone, and you're creating this massive collection of people who are going to die or be deformed or be exterminated before they're born when they see the experiment is going wrong. 
um, or maybe they get born and then they suffer from some kind of problem uh, medically during their life because the cloning procedure wasn't perfected. So there are dangers involved that, you know, um, we there are reasons why we test drugs and stuff rather than just hauling off and, and putting them into society. It's because they can have side effects and risks. Um, also, in uh, the process of cloning, and this is a process that sh a problem that's shared with in vitro fertilization. There's a problem of overproduction and then killing um, the overproduced offspring because um, the be in part because you don't know which ones are going to take. Scientists, whether in vitro or in making clones, will produce a whole bunch, hundreds or thousands, and then kill most of them. And that's not going to be acceptable either when you're doing it with humans. It may be acceptable when you're doing it with rabbit embryos, but it's not acceptable when you're doing it with unborn human beings. Then there's the fact that um, in order to produce a human clone, you'd have to invest a huge amount of resources to produce a clone baby. I mean, it would it would be millions of dollars, if not more to produce a human being um, and bring that baby successfully to term. And you have to ask, isn't this a waste just on an economic level? Why try, why spend all this money to produce a genetic, genetically identical copy of a, of a person so that you can raise them as a new human being? Shouldn't this money be spent on something better? Even, I mean, helping the poor or other medical research that would benefit more people. Why the obsession with creating a genetically identical baby? Um, that, you know, just to, just to feed some millionaire's fantasy life. Um, and so, and then even if you did do that, the clones, as we mentioned, would be living in the shadow of their progenitors, and they could potentially face discrimination. I mean, it would be really weird being around somebody. Now, I would, I, I myself, if I knew somebody, you know, was a clone of somebody else, I would not hold it against that person because I have a sharp awareness of the fact that um, children are not responsible for the sins of their parents. Um, so like if someone's born of rape, that is absolutely zero stain on the child. It was the, it was the father in the case of a male rapist. Um, and, and, and so that's not on the child, but a lot of people probably don't have a sharp awareness of that. And clones growing up in society could easily face discrimination. It's like, you know, you're not one of us. You're one of the strange ones. And uh, and so there are additional moral complications on that front. Now, somebody could be listening to this and they'll say, oh, well, it's a lot. You're, it's a lot of talk. But, you know, the fact is, is, is you've already said it's it's really hard to do. It's you know, it's how likely is it that we're going to see actual human cloning be, even be possible that this become an issue? Well, we've if the reports are right, we've already got it on the um, on the embryonic level because they had those ones in 2008 that were allowed to become blastocysts. If you ask me, even though I think human reproductive cloning is immoral, I think it's also probably inevitable. Um, there are no particular technical barriers that um, would prevent it from happening. Um, in fact, we've already had cloned primates just this year, 2018, um, a couple of crab-eating macaques, that's a kind of monkey, um, a couple of monkeys were cloned. And we know human clones are possible because we have identical twins. And even right now, you could, with an in vitro fertilized child, go in and at a certain stage, pull it apart and at a, have a good chance of having identical twins. <clears throat> So there's no, in principle, um, barrier stopping this. And as um, and as uh, is sometimes said in the world of physics, anything that is not impossible is inevitable. And so, um, to quote Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park, uh, some scientists are spending so much time thinking about what they could and not enough time thinking about whether they should. Uh, so I think human clones... On, at least on a small scale, are probably uh, inevitable at some point, okay. May, pro likely within the next hundred years. 
and when that happens, what you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about, like in these movies, is probably likely to happen. You know, the that yeah, they'll be u- uh, used and abused and discriminated against. Yeah, initially, because of the tremendous cost of producing them, we're likely to see um, this be a kind of boutique thing for millionaires. Um, you know, it's getting late in life and maybe they want a clone of themselves to carry on their legacy. But as if the technology begins to mature, you could then see more of these science fiction scenarios develop. Um, you could, for example, have if it if it be, you know, technology long term tends to make nations capable of things that even lesser developed nations once wouldn't have been able to do like, you know, Pakistan is not a particularly developed nation, but it has a nuclear bomb. Um, North Korea, same thing. Well, you could imagine uh, some future version of of a state like North Korea saying, let's have a clone army. Let's find a really good soldier and Django Fett this guy. (laughs) Um, So that's, you know, something that could happen. You could also see uh, something happening like what uh, was discussed in uh, Aldous Huxley's novel, Brave New World, where you have a stratification of society based on their genetic type, where you have, a, let's say, a clone under uh, worker underclass or something like that, or a clone uh, administrator overclass. You know, it, whether these would actually happen or not, you know, one would have to wait and find out. I'm not saying they're all equally likely, but uh, some, I, I can imagine a, a nation saying, let's have some clone warriors. Interesting. And yeah, it, as well as the, uh, there have been, you know, things like, uh, what was the show, uh, the movie that it featured, um, uh, forget the actors and the name of the movie, but there was a movie where uh, there was this enclave elsewhere of all of these, these people, very healthy people who were, would win a chance to go, I think it was called the Island and they would be sent mm. off to the Island. What they really were, were clones of wealthy people who were being kept as spare parts mm-hmm. for wealthy the, people in case they get sick. I, I'm not familiar with one called the Island there. That may be a remake. I'm familiar with one called parts, the clonus horror, mm. um, which had that plot and was later done on mystery science theater 3000. Um, I think more likely than cloning, though, in terms of military applications would be augmented human beings. I think there's it's more likely one would have a kind of uh, transhumanist effort to modify existing humans. But clones are not impossible. You could also see life extension, like you mentioned, with, uh, you know, spare spare parts for wealthy people. Um, You could also see attempts to have a kind of human Jurassic Park where we reproduce famous historical figures. Some people have even talked about going to the Shroud of Turin and getting DNA from it and trying to clone Jesus. Um, If you did that, you probably wouldn't end up with Jesus because so many pilgrims have kissed and touched the Shroud of Turin over the centuries that it's got lots of other people's DNA on it. Um, (laughs) But uh, even if you did, he wouldn't be the son of God. He would just be you would you would just have similar genes right right yeah well that's now there's an interesting sci-fi story someone uh could write uh oh they've done it <laughs> okay yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. right um all right and 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 this then and sci-fi is fascinated with cloning there continues to be stuff made there was a recent netflix series called altered carbon which uh, f- uh ex- you know included cloning as part of it so it's it's likely to be topical for a while so what's the the bottom line here with with regards to cloning? The bottom line is cloning of lesser species is not a problem. Uh reproductive cloning or cloning any entire human whether for reproductive or therapeutic purposes is immoral, but it's likely inevitable. Okay. All right. That's a sobering thought. Um and likely to be part of the pro life movement. Uh, not to, I don't want to get into politics, yep. but uh, but that should that probably going to be part of that. So if people want to find out more about this topic, uh, do we have some resources for them? Yeah. In the show notes, um, I have a number of links to uh, articles on Wikipedia about cloning in general, human cloning specifically, the ethics of cloning, different Christian views on cloning. I also have a link to an article by the geneticist James Watson 
uh, from the from 1971, when people were first starting to talk about cloning humans, where he raises concerns even back then about cloning humans coming from uh, a more secular perspective. Is this the James Watson who dis helped discover DNA? DNA, yes, okay. with Francis Crick. Okay. All right, great, thank you. And so uh, stick around, folks, because we're, we're we've got we're coming to uh, one of my come to be one of my favorite parts of the show, which is uh, mysterious feedback, where we hear from the audience. Um, and we've got some uh, feedback. Uh, this time we're talking about uh, feedback from our show on Watergate. Uh, that was uh, uh, episode number, uh, let's see, seven. And uh, our first feedback comes from M. Sutton Pratt on Facebook, who says, uh, there are a lot of theories about what happened at Watergate. I wonder if we'll ever know for certain. What do you think, Jimmy? Hey, it's, 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 a fascinating subject, and I think we are likely not to ever get definitive answers. And the reason I say that is because most of the people who were involved have now passed on. And if they were going to reveal what they knew, they would have done so. Even if they didn't want to do it in their own lifetimes, they would have like left manuscripts and like in the event of my death, I want this published. And um, we've probably been told the truth by by one or a number of them but um so the the real truth is probably out there the question is how do we identify it from among all the counterclaims and i don't know that we'll ever be able to do that so this one may remain a mystery but if we continue to chip away at it we may be able to develop a clearer picture interesting okay so and then richard lamb uh on youtube commented uh g gordon liddy used to have a syndicated radio show back in the 90s he would often label himself as a lapsed Catholic. He tended to lean conservative in his politics. Right. Uh, G. Gordon Liddy, and he was he was definitely conservative. He was he was um, a former FBI man who was one of the people who was on who was involved in the break in team. And he um, he did have a talk show in the 90s. And he I, I, I hadn't known he described himself as a lapsed Catholic. I knew he was a lapsed Catholic. I didn't know he said that on the talk show. Um, but according to a book I read by Chuck Colson, who was another one of the Watergate conspirators who later had a religious awakening, um, I was reading a book by Colson who mentioned that Liddy had at one point come back to his Catholic faith. Nice. So that was good. That's good. Uh, and then uh, finally, Jacob, uh, I'm, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, sorry. Jacob, uh, either Geese or Geis on YouTube says, uh, dudes, love the extra feedback at the end. That was fun. Great show. Uh, I agree with you, Jacob. I love the feedback, too. I do, too. <laughs> I, we really appreciate it. It adds a nice element to the show to be able to interact with people. So by all means, leave us feedback. We love getting it. Yes. Uh, and so uh, now uh, mystery headlines uh, or mysterious headlines, mystery headlines. Jimmy, what do we have this week for, for headlines? So a couple of things, both of them related to astronomy. Uh, the first one is the International Astronomical Union may be renaming a law of physics after a Catholic astronomer priest. The What we've known up to now as Hubble's Law deals with the expansion of the universe. It's named after Edwin Hubble, who in the late 1920s wrote a paper describing, this is like 1929, wrote a paper describing the expansion of the universe but he was preceded by a couple of years by the Belgian priest, Father George Lemaitre, who is these days credited as the man who basically came up with or promoted the initially promoted the idea of the Big Bang. It wasn't called the Big Bang yet, but um, but Lemaitre is credited with that. And because he, he wrote an earlier paper than Hubble's, um, even though it was published in French in kind of an obscure Belgian journal, so people didn't notice it as much. Um, the International Astronomical Union is considering uh, renaming the Hubble Law as the Hubble Lemaitre Law. So we have a link to an article describing the debate they're having on that right now. So uh, personally, I would be in favor of that, and it would be a lot better than the botched attempt to declassify Pluto as a planet that they <laughs> also were responsible for and that many of their members are unhappy with. And uh, in case uh, the name Edwin Hubble sounds familiar, he is the one for whom the Hubble telescope was named. Yes. Yeah. The other piece is um, uh, that we have a link to is a story about how astronomers may have found the planet Vulcan. Live long and um, prosper, folks. 
Yeah, <laughs> and not not the vanished Vulcan planet in our solar system that we're going to do a future episode about, but Mr. Spock's planet Vulcan. <laughs> um, the uh, the star in the constellation uh, er- Eridani, or uh, forget the exact suffix you want to put on that in Greek. Um, the uh, but the star that has in Star Trek auxiliary literature been identified as the home of uh, the planet Vulcan in Star Trek uh, turns out to have a star or to have a planet, it seems, that is slightly larger than Earth and within the habitable zone and would, if it's if it turns out to be a terrestrial planet um, rather than a mini gas giant, it would have a gravity of about twice that of Earth and it would also be quite warm and both of those characteristics fit Mr. Spock's home planet Vulcan, which is supposed to have a high gravity and be quite warm. Whether the new Vulcan has no moon, we don't yet have the ability to detect. In a future uh, episode, we're going to have the mystery of what did Gene Roddenberry know and when did he know it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nice Watergate quote from Senator Howard Baker there. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellent. Thank you, Jimmy. Those are very, those are two great headlines. And so, uh, as we come to the end of another episode, I want to remind folks to like, comment, subscribe, make sure you get notifications and above all, share the episode with with everyone uh, that you know to because we're having a blast and I hope you're having a blast and uh, more people could enjoy it. Uh, and and be sure also go to sqpn.com slash give because we really need your support right now. If you like this show and other ones we produce, we need to hear from you now. Yes. And uh, so that's it from us. Uh, please send us your feedback on uh, the mystery of cloning, whatever you have to say. Uh, in all those various places we mentioned, you, there are, are ways to give feedback. Uh, you can also send us an audio feedback and we can play that uh, on the show and interact uh, with you that way. That would be great to hear your voices. Uh, so you could... Uh, go to sqpn.com or to the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page. Leave us feedback there or send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. You will find links, uh, all the relevant links that uh, we mentioned in this episode, including the headlines on our show notes on sqpn.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bethanelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. This is Don Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com give. That's sqpn.com give.